Brownie Group. We're going to have a good time all together. My name is Alice. I'm the CEO of the uh, company. And I'm really, really glad uh, tonight to organize this uh, residency with you. And first, before I introduce you to the program and how it will go and, and uh, how we're going to enjoy the learn from today, I would like to welcome um, Jacques uh, to the uh, <coughs> Thanks to all for being here. It's a pleasure to, uh, to welcome you back in, uh, in Paris. Uh, just a few words uh, to start with. Uh, we had the pleasure to meet uh, Vivek during a business trip uh, in the summer of 2012 which is uh, over a year ago now. Um, we actually had contacted Singularity University, Peter Diamandis, who is one of the co-founders of the Singularity University. And uh, when I talked uh, with him over the phone, he told me that the, the man you need is uh, Vivek Wadwa. He gave me his uh, email or phone number, I don't remember exactly. Uh, we had the pleasure to meet him then. Uh, we had the pleasure to meet him during the second trip uh, in August of this year. And it's always very impressive to, uh, to listen to, to him. Uh, now, Vivek is able to talk about just, to just about anything I mean, related to innovation and entrepreneurship, of course, and the high tech and medicine and the Silicon Valley. So please, uh, during the second part, uh, don't refrain yourself from uh, asking questions and uh, exchanging with, uh, with him. In a few words, for, for those who really don't know him, but it's, it's going to be very short. Uh, presently, he's VP uh, of Innovation and Academics at uh, Singularity University, which is a postgraduate program in the Silicon Valley. Uh, initially, in his life, uh, he was an entrepreneur. He was even a serial entrepreneur. He serial starts at two, because he created and developed two uh, different companies in the uh, high-tech uh, area related to, uh, to software. Uh, apart from uh, being academic and uh, innovation uh, VP at uh, Similarity, he also uh, teaches at uh, Stanford around issues of governance, which is another aspect of uh, the future and innovation. He's also, uh, you'll see from time to time, uh, articles or blogs or whatever, in uh, newspapers, well-known newspapers like Forbes or Business Week or uh, the Wall Street Journal. What is interesting also is that uh, he has been uh, at the forefront of uh, discussions around immigration and how uh, to change the immigration laws for talent, for skilled people in the United States. Uh, there is a great need for people also in the Silicon Valley. And more recently, he has uh, worked over the, uh, the topic of uh, women in tech, uh, diversity, how to uh, make sure and what we can do so that we have more women in management positions on, on boards of high-tech uh, companies. And this is the reason why he was invited at the Women's Forum in Deauville over the last uh, two and a half days. That's all. I, I won't say more. Uh, and you can. Uh, we, we can continue. Hi, sure, I'm uh, Arthur Le Guignou, so I'm representing the Lista de Jean, which is for organizing this event. So we've been doing, as we said uh, before, this uh, business trip in California, so we've been organizing that over the last two years. And uh, we're given to meet Vivek, which is to me, who is to me the, one of the most soulful person I ever met. <laughs> to say it. And uh, really feel free to, to ask questions and to engage in into any conversation. I'm, I'm pretty sure you can answer in a way you, you will be surprised of. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you, Alice, for organizing this thing. That's really great what you do. Thank you. All right. And uh, because we're talking about the ecosystem, tonight it's possible also thanks to these partners. So it's uh, Vincent from uh, ESG who uh, received our call. Vincent, we have you back. Uh, can you ask us? Uh, it's going to be uh, super great. He said yes. Can you just present this call? Thanks, Alice. Uh, very quickly, 
Uh, welcome to all of you. I'm Vincent. I'm one of the professors in e-business at EFC Management School. We are one of the highest business schools in France. Uh, 17 specializations going from finance to entrepreneurship to sole business. You said thank you, Russell. Thank you. Um, thanks again. Thanks a lot to be here to be tonight. Uh, hope you will enjoy this as much as I will. So I have a good evening and talk to you, all of you doing a little drink and stuff and uh, we're going to have just after this. Thanks again. Thanks. And I thank also because we are thanking everybody. So we want more girls. We just want more girls. So we have girls in tech with us. We want more engineers, we want more geeks, so we have also Epitech, Startup 42 and Creative Valley with us. We want more coverage uh, to talk about uh, what's happening in this innovative uh, ecosystem. So we welcome Ruth Baggett, Madness, and uh, App Magazine as our media partner. So we, as a family, we introduce ourselves as an ecosystem accelerator, not only just an accelerator. So we address the startups and some of them are here tonight. We address also corporates, investors, and officials, and people working for the government. It's really important to align the interests of the different actors to be able to make a change, and we understood this. But we, we couldn't just copy past a model that is already working in Silicon Valley, right? We don't have the same patterns, we don't have the same culture, we don't have this big back and forth, we don't talk business the way we talk business, there are many things that we are different at, and we are our own strengths, our own weaknesses. And what we want to learn tonight is actually how did they analyze the strengths and the weaknesses of this the ecosystem that we accompanied, uh, because it's not only uh, the US, but it's also Chile, Russia, and understand how we can adapt this to our own ecosystem. So I really hope that we're going to learn tonight. And I know we're going to learn. So now I leave you with my co-founder, one of my co-founder, Usama, uh, who is here to exchange and give the, the world to the yeah. Thank you very much. Let's enjoy. So, good evening, Vivek. Uh, it's really a pleasure to have you with us. Uh, maybe you, you can start with a little background about yourself and introducing how, how an entrepreneur can have gone from such an exciting life to academia. Well, uh, I founded two companies. I was an entrepreneur and then I had a heart attack. So that was my life-changing event. I had, uh, I mean, my wife wouldn't let me go back to being an entrepreneur because as you people know, it's not an easy life. You're always uh, uh, you know, losing sleep, you're working day and night, uh, and you're taking big risks. So I decided to take it easy and become an academic. So this is my retirement right now. <laughs> so, so when did you retire? Uh, well, about 10 years ago. <laughs> and, and yeah, being an academic is easy, being an entrepreneur is hard, I tell you. Um, um, you know, people think that, it's, um, uh, that, that professors work very hard, professors have great lives. <laughs> that, that's a message for the school. <laughs> right. And can you tell us a little about what you were doing as an entrepreneur before? I found it, uh, my first software company was actually um, a spin off from work I had done at, done at First Boston. This is in the 1980s when we were talking about building distributed computing systems, systems that ran on multiple computers. In those days, that was like Star Wars. Today, you have your iPhone, you have your laptop, you have your cloud server. It's normal. In the 80s, it was like science fiction. So I built a system that could run on multiple, multiple computers. And that was so successful that it led to the creation of a spin-off company called Sear Technologies, in which we commercialized the technology. We grew it from zero to 120 million in five years. Spectacular IPO, and then not spectacular. And I ended up leaving and starting my second company, which was in... Um, Reengineering legacy systems. And spectacular success. And then uh, got into trouble. I fixed the company and I broke myself. So, I just, so I, then I decided to do something different for a living. This is my new life of, of just sort of giving talks, meeting great people, <laughs> and creating controversy. Yeah, that, 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 that's what we call an investor. <laughs> right. Um, can you tell us about how, how you started in, in academic and why you focus on entrepreneurship? Because that was not a very common subject when you started. I actually started looking at, um, 
When I joined uh, Duke University uh, about uh, nine years ago, there was a big concern in America about outsourcing, the threat from India and China. The belief was that uh, because India and China were graduating so many engineers, that the US was in trouble. And I knew from having done outsourcing to India and China that there was no threat from India and China, that uh, even though they were graduating a lot of engineers, the quality of education was so bad that it was holding them back. So I started publishing articles on that, which created a lot of controversy. And then I started looking into US competitiveness. Why is it the US, US leads the world in, in, uh, in innovation? So I started looking at America's advantages. The first thing was immigration. This is something which uh, was a shock to me because uh, I had heard that there were a lot of immigrants in Silicon Valley. When we did a systematic uh, survey of companies in Silicon Valley and the rest of America, we were absolutely stunned to look at the results that 52% of the startups in Silicon Valley are founded by people born abroad. People like us, people like me, people from China, people from Brazil, people from Australia, Iran, all over the world, 52%. You know, that's particularly mind-blowing considering that Silicon Valley is the most innovative place in the world. You wouldn't think that it's all foreigners. When you go to America, you realize, and when you go to Silicon Valley, you realize that the culture is very different than anywhere else in the world. So for a foreigner to be able to go to America and then be able to uh, dominate Silicon Valley is a big deal. So then I started studying entrepreneurship. Uh, what, you know, what is it about America that makes people like me and people like you go there and become so successful? Because the French people I know in Silicon Valley uh, well, this crowd is different, but traditionally the, the French people I've known, they tend to be big company, bureaucratic, uh, you know, socialist thinkers. When they, when, they, when they come to Silicon Valley, they become like animals. I mean, <laughs> I mean really, they become much more free, risk-taking. Um, I mean, it's a different breed of people. This is the French. Yeah, actually, and actually, you are talking about brainwash. <laughs> I, I heard this expression from you many times, but right. maybe you can give a little about that. Well, the same thing happens with Indians, I mean, and Chinese. In India and China, you don't innovate. You go to Silicon Valley, and now suddenly you're taking risks. So I started studying entrepreneurship. What makes America what it is? And you know, in America, they have this thing called the American dream. American dream is all about American success. When you really understand what the American dream is, you realize it's entrepreneurship, that here, Joining a big company is something your parents want you to do, something you strive for. That's a sign of success, becoming uh, a vice president in a, in a big company. In America, starting a company from scratch and becoming successful is, is the national, um, is what you're you know, most respected. So the national heroes are not uh, Charles de Gaulle and you know, presidents. National heroes are Bill Gates, Steve Jobs, now Mark Zuckerberg. Those are the people who everyone looks up to, are entrepreneurs. That's the American dream, that's the American way. That's what differentiates America from other countries. And this is why when people like you and I go to uh, Silicon Valley, we adapt very easily. We learn that, um, you know, you know here, here's what happens, Osama, that he, when you're here, most of the people here are from middle class families. Some are from rich families. Very few are from extremely poor families because to succeed, you have to now, um, uh, be in the, in the middle class. If you go to America, you're taking a risk. You're leaving behind the comfort of home. You're leaving behind something that you, that you know very well to go to a land where you're a foreigner. Okay. Even though um, uh, you, know, you, you came from a, a, a rich background, when you go to America, you, you don't understand the culture. You, have a, you speak a foreign language. Weird, you, know, uh, you feel different, you look different. You're at the bottom of the social hierarchy there. So, when, when people like us go there, we suddenly realize that, that we have to now, um, um, that we see other people, you know, this is a big difference between, France is changing, but 30, 40 years ago, the only big successful people here were French. You couldn't be a foreigner and be successful in France. That's changing now because there are some, uh, some successes, but, but when you go to America, you see a lot of foreigners who are successful. You look all across the industry, you see successful um, immigrants. So when people like us go there, we see that, look, uh, you have this Indian who's at the top of this company, you have this Chinese, you have this Frenchman, you have this woman who are at the top of American business, who are respected over there. You realize that you can be like them. And you realize you can be like them, and you start now dreaming of the same success 
that other people from abroad achieved. And you catch the entrepreneurial bug. That's why people like us are successful. That's why Silicon Valley thrives, because you have people from diverse backgrounds, from, from diverse education systems who have this fire in their belly, who have this obsession with wanting to succeed and achieve big success. And they go there and they, they drive America. This is why America leads the world. Because America is a land of immigrants. You have wave after wave of immigrants coming to America and making the natives compete harder. Isn't that broken? Because I know you I follow you a lot on, on Facebook, you, you wrote this book. Osama, uh, I'm in France right now. Okay, When I'm in America, you hear me beating up America <laughs> for, uh, <laughs> for having a broken immigration system. But when I'm over here, I'm going to tell you the way it really is. Okay, <laughs> That um, anyone can go to America and, and even immigrants figure out how to work within the system. However it is, um, they go there, they start their companies, they'll get temporary visas, they'll overstay their visas, they'll do whatever they have to, they figure out how to stay and to make the country successful. Now, the, the, the reason why I'm so critical about America is that before, when you had students going there, they would automatically stay there. That, um, you, know, you know, like, um, I, there's some foreign students over here, but the, the uh, expectation would be that when you graduated from an American university, you would stay there forever. Now, by default, they go back. Even the Europeans are going back because they can't get visas. Entrepreneurs, when they go there, they're very tough. They find ways to become part of the system, so they're still staying there, legally or illegally, or whatever they have to do. They'll come on one visa and then they'll start their company, or they'll keep, they'll get a, a work, a business visa, and they just, you can stay up to six months, they'll just stay up to six months and then go back for a week and then come back again. So they work their way around the system. That's what really happens, even though I, I don't talk about it in America because I don't want to get my friends in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> so, so immigration is, is one of the uh, big subjects. Now, uh, what are for you the, the key components of a successful experience? Because you say Silicon Valley is based on American dream, but, but there is other parts of the world based on that. For example, China is very this Chinese dream of I, I work very, very hard. No, the Chinese dream is I, I copy very, very hard. I yeah, steal, I steal <laughs> technology from America <laughs> and I duplicate it in our Chinese uh, thing and then I uh, bribe some officials in the Communist Party and they, um, uh, and they help me now own my space and then we rig the deck so that these companies can succeed so that the Communist Party can get richer. That's a Chinese system, okay? Let's not talk about that. Okay. <laughs> and, 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 and do you think that the American dream is, is, is present around the world right now? Yeah, because uh, the Chinese dream now, uh, yeah, okay, so this is, uh, so there are two Chinas. This is the traditional China I'm talking about. You also have the entrepreneurial China. You go to Beijing, Shanghai, and you meet entrepreneurs like this. They are, uh, they are as negative about the Chinese government as I am. Um, things I'm saying, they'll think that you're being very nice to us, right? Because they, they see the same problems that we see, and they also, most of these entrepreneurs are not from the Communist Party. They're not the, um, uh, you know, the evil regime that's corrupt and ruining the country. They are young people like us who want to make an impact, who want to change the country, who want to build world-changing technology. So you see this new generation of Chinese, that's what I'm very hopeful about. When I go to Tsinghua University, Fudan University, when I go to the colleges over there, I see the next generation and I'm very ho ho hopeful about them. And then you step outside the university, you see the old generation, and that's what you're disgusted with. So there are two Chinas, but the new China is very much like, like this, which wants to innovate and which wants to change the world. Yeah, it looks like France. Yeah, exactly. So you have the same problem in France. You have the old and you have the new. The new is, is what you're, you're incubating over here. Yeah. Right. So what are the other components of a successful research campaign? Okay, I'll tell you what doesn't work. Okay, yeah. and this is something you know, we talked about when, yeah. when you were in Silicon Valley. Um, uh, Professor Michael Porter from Harvard Business School, he has this theory about clusters. You go to, if you go to any business school, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry I'm at a business school, uh, I'm going to have to be disrespectful. That's fine, that's fine. Yeah. All right. <laughs> they teach you about Michael Porter and, and, and uh, how to do innovation. The recipe is that you start off with a research university, you um, um, select an industry, and then you um, bribe industry to come into this region by giving them tax breaks and other incentives, and then you create a venture capital fund, and then you wait, sit back and and wait for innovation to happen. There have been hundreds of efforts all over the world over the last 30 or 40 years to do this. Uh, some country, Japan spent $20 billion. China has probably spent more than that. Guess how many successes there are? Zero. 
Zippo, nada. Uh, what's the French word for zero? Zero. Zero, zero okay. <laughs> <laughs> zero successes. So this whole theory about clusters is a fraud, a scam. It, it's a way for consultants to make a lot of money by going and, and doing expensive consulting assignments with regions. This is why when we were talking about... Uh, Maybe I can tell the story. Tell the story, go ahead. So, uh, two years and a half ago, I, I was working on a mission to build uh, a Silicon Valley in Brazil. So that was to start up from start. And I saw one of my friends told me, you have to meet Vivek, it, it will be great. So I, I, I came at the conference of Vivek and said, hi, my name is Usama, I work for the Brazilian government and I want to open a big incubator. And I just said that, as Vivek became white, it was like, incubators, incubators never work, that's a scam. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it was not, he was trying to build a cluster, he was talking about yeah. a hundred million dollar budget, where we, we have yeah, uh, we'll all this it. money, <laughs> that's destined to be a disaster. So and gov I, government doing it, double disaster. So one hour later I was convinced, and, <laughs> and I came back to Brazil and I told them it would never work, I met that guy, his name is Vivek, you have to invite him. I, I think you really understand what nobody of us is understanding at the table. And they fired him. And they fired him. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> but that was fine. That was great. So right. the incubator has been created. Okay, but, but, it, but no it, fa it, it failed, didn't it? Yeah, right? it failed. It failed. <laughs> so, I was right. I said the same thing to Russia. I mean, I wrote an article oh, that's a great story. in Business Advice. You can share that story. It yeah. Great. So Russia, the President Putin has this thing called Skolkovo which he's going to spend a billion dollars on. They're building a magnificent new city next to uh, uh, Moscow, 50 miles from Moscow. Billions of dollars they're going to put into it. And the government is raving about it. I read about it in the New York Times, and I, and I wrote an article for Business Week talking about why it's destined to fail. I said, what's going to happen over here is that the real estate moguls will get filthy rich. The government officials will get filthy rich. They will do lots of press announcements. And then there'll be nothing to show for it. It'll be a complete disaster. And there was outrage when I published that. And, and then I got invited to Russia. Uh, four months later, I got invited to Russia by the New York Academy of Sciences to um, um, Yaroslavl. There was a mil thousand millennium over there. And the president of the New York Sci Academy of Sciences is a friend of mine, Ellis Rubinstein. Ellis uh, says, Vivek, can you please come with me there? I said, Ellis, are you crazy? They're going to lock me up in a gulag over there. <laughs> they have these gulags where they lock dissidents up over there. He says, no, Vivek, they won't. Uh, uh, I've been assured that they want to listen to you. So I went there, big, I mean, big, huge thing broadcast on two TV channels. I, I didn't know it was going to be, uh, you know, and, and then they had government ministers, they had the vice premier of China on the stage. They had uh, the uh, former president of India on the, on the stage. They had the president of Korea on the stage, okay? And I'm sitting there, and then suddenly in the, in the middle of this talk, I mean, imagine a stage, really, really fancy, 500 dignitaries there. Um, um, the Berlusconi, the, yeah. the, the Italian Berlusconi. premier, Angela Merkel, yeah. uh, all of these dignitaries over there. And then they're talking, I'm falling asleep because it's all government propaganda. <laughs> and then they say, Bibek Wadwa. And I'm sort of, you know, I, I, I put my headset down and then they start looking at me. Um, and the, you know, uh, one of the uh, people on the stage is looking at me saying, please come up. And I'm saying, well, what am I supposed to do? I didn't know I was supposed to give a talk. And then I go up there, they had a countdown timer, 12 minutes. I had to talk in front of all of these uh, officials. I was not ready to give a talk. I, mean, I had no idea I was going to be asked to give a talk over there in front of the Russian parliament and so on. I started thinking about it. I said, you know, I'm going to tell them the way it is. So I went up there and I said uh, uh, that uh, I wrote a Business Week article predicting Skolko was going to fail. And that's what I believe. Here's why it's going to fail. And then I also said that, look, I also know Russia. I've done outsourcing over here. Here are the good things that, that they have. Here's what I suggest to do. And guess what? They didn't listen to anything I said. So I blasted them. And I, I, and I, had, I had people cheering me on at, uh, in the audience. I had um, the mayor of, of Yaroslavl and all these people coming up, shaking my hand, saying thank you for speaking up and telling the truth. <laughs> and then they didn't listen to one word that I said. That was it. And guess what? Um, Skolkovo, they spent, I don't know, a billion dollars on it. Complete disaster. Just like I said it would be. That's what's wrong with government-led efforts, that they never work. Let's talk about one of your success, Startup right. Chile. Right. Uh, startup, uh, who in this room know about Startup Chile? That's pretty good. 
Yeah. Yeah. Very quickly, Startup Chile uh, started four years ago. Uh, about three years ago, about the same time I met you. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, three years ago, and, and, and the goal is pretty simple, is bringing people to Chile from outside to start company and build the community of, of people very entrepreneurial to change radically the local ecosystem. So maybe you, we can talk Well, about. what happened was that um, the, Russian, the Chileans also read my articles and they were very proud. They, they, uh, I had, there's a group called Corfo, with a government group. They invited me to come to an event hosted by the president of Chile. And they wanted me to come and look at their outsourcing industry. And, and you know, because I was, I was considered the expert on outsourcing. I mean, I was like one of the gurus of outsourcing. You know, presidential invitation. And uh, then they said they'll fly me there first class. So I said, fine, I get to go to Chile and, and hang out and, and learn all this. So I went there. And they gave me a tour of the outsourcing industry. And then they told me about these clusters that they said. The moment they said clusters, you know, my blood pressure rises a bit. I hear about that. <laughs> so um, I told them over there at the conference that, I, you know, they also gave me the VIP treatment, fancy Chilean wine. I said, you know, I love the wine. I'm really grateful that you uh, brought me over here and you spent all this money on me and so on. But you're, uh, you're from Chile? No, your, your industry is destined to fail. They'd, also, they didn't believe me. They didn't listen to me. So I went back and I wrote an article in Business Week about why it's destined to fail. I said that, you know, a country of 14 million people wants to compete with India in outsourcing. That's like India wanted to compete with Chile in copper. <laughs> that they, this is not going to happen and it's going to fail. Um, fortunately, the Chilean uh, government isn't corrupt. Chilean has got one of the most competent. This, is amaze, this will amaze French people that you can actually have competent government. You can have competent uh, uh, ministers. The Chilean government is one of the most impressive uh, governments I've ever met. Because normally about governments, I'm always negative. So I mean, equal, uh, when it comes to all governments, I'm equally negative about all of them. But the Chileans, um, I was very impressed with. So the economics minister of Chile came to uh, Stanford University. Nico Shea was, is his, well, you know, he was recruiting Nisha Shea to head up innovation for him. So I had dinner with him and Nico Shea. And he says, Vivek, I read your Business Week article. You were very negative about it. What do you think we should do? I said, you know, do an experiment. The key to building an innovation cluster, the key to building Silicon Valley is not uh, industry. It's not venture capital. It's not government. It's people. An experiment here. We need to now bring people to, uh, to uh, Chile. I said, America is losing skilled immigrants. That, uh, there's too many entrepreneurs that come here who can't start companies here. Let's bring them to Chile. He says, they will never come. I said, give them a little bit of a bribe and they'll come. He says, uh, no, they will never come to Chile. The only people who will get are Nicaraguans. Nicaraguans, I don't know, here you have gyps gypsies in France. In America, we have Mexicans who are, you know, the derided people, I mean, uh, and this wrongfully so. I mean, I don't know about the gypsies, but the Mexicans are very hardworking people. I mean, really, you know, contribute very significantly to the American economy. In Chile, they have the Nicaraguans who they perceive to be uh, immigrants who will just come and take opportunities away. He said, only the Nicaraguans will come. I said, no, uh, Minister, you'll get entrepreneurs from, from, uh, from, uh, from all over the world. So we, he basically went back and got a $1 million budget to see what happens if you bring foreigners over there. Uh, they offered $40,000. I wrote an article in TechCrunch about it. I said uh, something to the effect that Chile welcomes entrepreneurs. They were stunned when they received 100, 116 applications. And they picked 25 companies, and they came there, and they were amazed at what was happening uh, in a small part of uh, Santiago, that you had entrepreneurs now um, working with each other. You had entrepreneurs now going to the local colleges, and you know, like, like this university, coming here and speaking to students and recruiting them, telling them about entrepreneurship, and trying to get them to work for their companies. They had suddenly all this magic happening in Santiago that they never imagined before. So based on the success of Startup Chile and the work that Nico Shea and the minister did, they decided to scale it up. Now they have, now there have been more than 600 uh, startups there. And Santiago has become famous for entrepreneurship. It's buzzing with activity. We have activity, the local ecosystem is changing. You're having the same magic happening there that you see in Silicon Valley. And by the way, um, I have to give you credit also. What I heard about the family, I was very impressed with. Because what, you know, what uh, the incubator the friends are doing is focusing only on people, on, on trying to bring the Silicon Valley culture here. It's not about venture capital. It's not about uh, um, uh, anything except networking, people to people networking. And I don't know if you're going to be successful at getting French people to help each other or not. 
and to work with each other. But if you can do that, you will have the magic happening over here. The concept is, is, is really good. So I'm, I'm telling you that if you do it right, you're going to succeed, not fail. Cool. Right. <laughs> that, that's a great endorsement. Thank you. Paul. But there are a lot of things you have to do right. So. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we, we are trying to work out. Um, there is something that was fascinating me when, when I was in Silicon Valley, hearing you yelling at white male doing social network. And you know, one of the biggest problems we have as a family is that four projects on five that's coming is for next social network. Because I think that that basically is a mimetic of entrepreneurship. Maybe we, uh, if, if I can have a public statement in, in Okay, terms of I tell you, there's, a, there's, there's, there's an opportunity for social networks. Uh, you know, I was also critical about Foursquare. I, I, if you followed my battles on TechCrunch with uh, some of the, uh, the people behind TechCrunch, I was attacking them for hyping Foursquare the way. They must have gotten some stock in. That's the way it works with TechCrunch. It, so the way it used to work with TechCrunch was that if you gave stock to the right people, you would get great coverage. Yeah. So, so that's what happened with Foursquare, and I was equally critical about it. What I said was that uh, location-based networking will become a feature versus a product. It's the same thing with social media. Social media will become a feature. Facebook is doing fine right now, but Facebook over time will disappear into the ecosystem. It'll become a it already is becoming that. I'll tell you what the opportunities are in social networking. You know, for example, um, uh, let's say that you're building uh, a company which, um, you know, I mean, they take healthcare in, um, in discovery, that you're now coming up with a way of uh, prescribing drugs and so on. You put people with the same disease together into a social network so that they can talk to each other. Okay. You're trying to in, uh, help farmers in um, the different parts of France. So that you have the grape growers in different parts of France. You create a social network for them, and then you connect them with grape growers in, in Chile. Uh, you connect them with grape growers in uh, San Francisco. You go to some different regions, and now you create social networks for them so they can learn from each other. So the opportunity is now to create smaller social networks where you have communities coming together which can help each other. Because over the next five years or so, you're going to find that another three billion people come online. The, the, I mean, the, the um, connectivity in the world is going to increase exponentially, which means that the opportunities for social media are going to increase exponentially. Those people will not mostly go on Facebook. Some will go on Facebook, they'll create accounts, and then they'll get bored just like the existing people are getting. And they'll get tired of Facebook stealing their privacy, selling their information, taking their photos and putting them on ads for uh, people that they happen to endorse. Even Google is stepping to the act. There will be a ma massive backlash against all of these companies that are overselling um, the social media information. And the opportunity will be for private networks. So massive opportunity, but think small over here. Don't uh, think big when it comes to applications and about the opportunities to provide automation. But when it comes to social networking, think small about select groups, bringing them together. Assume that the population will increase dramatically. And, and uh, you know, in fact, I'd, I'd love to talk a little bit about the, why I say it's going to increase dramatically. Sure. Yeah. Now I'm taking, I'm taking a side tour. I'm getting off social networking. Let's talk about tablet computers. One of my pet projects is to accelerate the tablet revolution. You know, um, when I go back home, I will have my iPhone S. It was being delivered uh, this week uh, to my house. The iPhone S costs six, seven hundred dollars, probably a thousand dollars in France because everything costs ridiculously more in France than it should, right? But um, we pay it in euro. You pay in euro, yeah, exactly. And then you, it's even more than that, which is which is shocking to me that what should cost you know one point five times less costs one time five times more plus you've got the euro penalty over here. That's a different different problem. So the cost of tablets is co is constant right now. That every release of the iPhone costs about, you know, magically it still costs six, seven hundred dollars. So even though the cost of components is dropping, the tablet still costs the same. The cheapest commercial tablet you can get is about two hundred fifty dollars or so in, in the USA. Why? When the processor is getting cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. If you go to India, you go to China, in China you have, uh, you know, dirt cheap tablet devices, but the, the intellectual property is stolen. So, so China can't export them. You go to India and now you can buy dirt cheap tablet devices with the intellectual property is patented, it's not stolen, which are now being um, uh, produced for about, uh, the cost of uh, this, they have seven inch Android tablets in India, which cost about $32, $32 to produce. I did an experiment. 
Um, and uh, the, the, by the way, the earlier versions of tablets were garbage, the newer versions of tablets are excellent. I did an experiment. I took those tablets from India and I persuaded Esther Watsiki, who is Sergey Brin's mother-in-law and a, a famous teacher in Palo Alto. She teaches at Palo Alto High. Silicon Valley, um, uh, the, uh, you know, is, the, is Palo Alto, Menlo Park. So the children of the richest people in Silicon Valley, the um, um, Palo Alto, you know, venture capitalists and so on, go to Palo Alto High. So Esther teaches, teaches them. I, I got her about 10 tablets from India. She gave it to her, to her students. She asked them to use it in class. She asked them to take it home and then write reports on it. We were shocked that uh, the students actually liked the tablets. They complained that, look, when I play this game over here, this screen is very slow, that this jumps over here. Another student complained that, look, when I take, take it home, the Wi-Fi is very slow. But the fact is that they were using $35 devices from India. These are people who are used to iPads, iPhones, who, who have the highest end devices. They were using cheap, the cheap, same tablets that the poor peasants in India are using, and they gave it a thumbs up. We were shocked. So now, then we did the experiment in Durham, North Carolina, where um, one of my friends um, runs uh, a summer camp for, for disadvantaged African-American youth. In America, there's a lot, like there is in France, there's a lot of poverty in America, so we gave it to children who left out, who, who, who don't have access to technology. We want to see what happens. They loved it also. For them, it was life-changing because for the first time now, they had tablet computers. They had access to the internet. They were able to take videos. They were able to do school experience. They were able to now participate the same way the rich kids in Palo Alto are. That experiment was very successful. In about two weeks, we're doing a hackathon in um, uh, the Computer History Museum in Mountain View and then another one in Oakland, California. We're gonna have 250 poor children who's, who don't have access to technology doing hackathons. They're gonna be building apps for these tablets. And the next step after, so that the cheap tablets from India work and you can give them to rich children and they succeed. The next thing is that I'm encouraging the manufacturers of these tablets to start, this, but this is, if you're blogging about this, don't, don't tweet about this, uh, but this is just between us. I'm encouraging the manufacturers of the uh, tablets to make them in the USA. And they believe they can make seven inch Android tablets with 1.2 gigahertz dual core processors, the same as the earlier iPads, for $49 um, uh, sold on the internet, made in the USA tablets. If this happens, then it's gonna set off uh, a, a chain of events because you're gonna have other vendors trying to now compete at the lower end. And even in France, you'll probably have 49 Euro tablets which are as good as are the, some of the tablets you're using today. So move forward two or three years, you will have billions of people now getting cheap devices. In India, you have a billion users who are using cell phones. You have 100, uh, 200 million smartphones. In China, you have about half a billion smartphones. Right? So within the next five years or so, you will have billions of people worldwide coming online. And what's gonna happen in the developed world is that you'll have tablets being used for everything that uh, just imagine when you get into your car, you have a tablet on your dashboard. Even though the cars don't come, you know, I have a Tesla. My Tesla has a beautiful, huge, you know, 17 inch display, which is the uh, central nervous system of the car, right? Imagine now being able to have um, uh, Wi-Fi enabled, Bluetooth enabled tablets in your car, which are connected to your cell phone, which now give you GPS guidance, which now you can talk to. And these tablets cost $50 to retrofit into your car. Imagine now um, going to restaurants and having tablets for ordering, going to dry cleaners and having tablets for what you do there. Everywhere you look, tablets. When prices drop to 30, 40, 50 euros, that'll happen. And that'll happen within, within less than five years. My, I, I optimistically think that within two to three years it'll happen. It could be uh, four years, it could be five years. But it's gonna happen very rapidly, which means that you're gonna have an explosion of internet usage. You're gonna have an explosion of devices. You're gonna have an explosion of uh, opportunities to embed social media in everything you do. You will have refrigerators that, refrigerators that are connected by social media. You, that, that, uh, you, your, your fridge will talk to uh, your uh, toothbrush, will talk to your doctor, <laughs> and now gossip about what you just ate and, and what you just did. I mean, you can just think of crazy applications for social media. But again, it's not the social media we're talking about. It's not the Facebook and the Twitter social media. It's about, uh, it's about um, now connectivity and bringing groups online 
and bringing uh, you know, like-minded devices, like-minded people, like-minded applications on and all connected together. That's the world we're moving into rapidly. So that's what we should start building towards. Can we talk a little about your work at Singularity now? Right, right. Because it's directly linked to this one billion uh, people opportunity by, by sector. So right. Let me drink some water. Yeah, please. Because so, now we're changing gears again. So who knows Singularity University in this room? Look, you are present. Oh, that's amazing. <laughs> so for the one that uh, are too shy to put up their hands on, uh, Singularity University started a uh, few years ago, created by Peter Diamandis, and their goal is to take 80 students, I believe, uh, 80 students every year to learn how, in fact, uh, 1 billion people will last about 10 years. So that's Singularity University, yeah, founded by Peter Diamandis and Ray Kurzweil, and uh, it's on the NASA campus, uh, yeah. so the NASA is a partner, Google is a partner, Autodesk and, and so on. And the faculty of Singularity University is just amazing. We have astronauts, scientists, leading engineers, thinkers, and then you have industry gurus like Dean Kamen, who invented the Segway, Vince Cerf, the father of the internet, Craig Venter, who sequenced the genome. They speak at our events. But the goal, and it's more than uh, the 10-week program that uh, Osama talked about. We also have executive programs, one-week executive programs. And then we have uh, special, like for example, uh, November 14th and 15th, this is something that all of you who can should go to Budapest, November 14, 15, for the Singularity University uh, Summit there. Because what we do is that we take people like you and we teach them about advances in, in other fields. My guess is that most of you are experts in computing. Some of you might be experts in biology. Some of you might be experts in robotics. But there are many fields that are advancing exponentially. Everything from um, uh, computing, 3D printing, nanotechnology, synthetic biology, you know, medicine, and so you, you can go field after field after field. There are advances happening at light speed. We've, you know, the iPhone, this already has, this device over here already has more computing power than existed on the planet the day I was born. You don't have to know how old I am, but, but uh, <laughs> this is more powerful than the Cray supercomputers were, right? This sits idle waiting for me to check email or to tweet. Uh, and every you know, now and then I'll get a, once or twice a day I'll get a phone call. But this supercomputer is just sitting idle there. My next iPhone that I'm waiting for is about 400 times more powerful in certain ways. That's a supercomputer on top of a supercomputer, right? That's exponential technology. Now imagine the same thing happening with, I'll, I'll give another example, uh, the human genome. 12 years ago, there was a race between uh, Craig Venter and the US government. It was called, the, 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 do you remember the Human Genome Project? They were going to sequence the entire human genome. It cost over a billion dollars for the US government to get there. And then Craig Venter comes along, takes the data from the government for $100 million, he rapidly sequences the genome, and he beats the, the US government to the punch on sequence. An entrepreneur beats the US government to sequencing the human genome. It was an amazing, amazing feat. And then 10 years happened and nothing, nothing happened with the human genome. So you had to start people about two years ago getting pessimistic, saying, look, we spent billions of dollars. We were so excited about the human genome and nothing happened. So now you're hearing about all these amazing advances happening. Now, now human genome sequencing would cost a billion dollars uh, 12 years ago. You can get it done for about $3,000 today. How much? $3,000 today for a complete human genome. Within five years, it's very likely, uh, almost certain, that the cost of a human genome will be less than $100. By the end of this decade, it's likely to be less than a cup of coffee for a complete human genome. And in fact, my iPhone case uh, is, a, is made by a company called Alive Core. It's an EKG monitor. Uh, I mean, any old people in this room, have, you, have you, any of you had EKGs done before? Uh, Electrocardiographs. Yeah. Oh my God, a woman? Yeah. Oh no. <laughs> all right, um, it's really a painful process. They put all those electrodes in you. Here you just touch the two leads on my phone, it does an electrocardiograph. Okay. So the cost of sequencing a genome has dropped, which means that we become software. That just like you write the searches to find data on, uh, on the web, you can now write searches to, to uh, understand the correlation between the human genome, your lifestyle habits, 
uh, your medications you take, your disease, all sorts of other variables. So over the next few years, you will start seeing commercial applications that you can start building, which start correlating the genome to all sorts of uh, disease and finding cures for disease based on other things. So um, social media, and coming back to that, imagine having social media set up by, by your DNA. People who have common genes now connect with each other and they start discussing uh, the, the challenges that they face. So let's say we find a gene that makes people fat. Right? So now you find people uh, connected all over the world who have the same gene and they find that if they eat this one herb, they lose weight. Okay? That they eat this other herb, they feel really good. Or you know, they, they, they do X, Y, and Z. So now they can start connecting with each other and, and prescribing remedies to each other. So this is what's become possible using exponential technologies. My iPhone is, the call is um, computing coming together with sensors coming together with, with medicine. Billion dollar industry. So you can have thousands of different types of sensors being used for different purposes, which now become world changing. We can start creating trillion dollar industries right now by understanding exponential technologies. This is the opportunity for all of you that start thinking outside social media. I mean, stop getting obsessing over social media. Start thinking about the opportunities to use exponential technologies to um, come up with world-changing applications. Because it's not hard to learn about sensors, it's not hard to learn about biology, it's not hard to learn about uh, uh, the advances that are happening in, in medicine and robotics and AI and, and so on, and start applying those applications to new fields. That's where the magic happens. And, and again, uh, the reason why I said you should go to the Singularity University Summit is because in two days you will get a crash course, a one-week course in advancing technologies. Many of my colleagues from Singularity University are going and presenting over there. So it'll be an amazing experience. And you know something, VCs, in, uh, 10 years ago when you went to Silicon Valley, uh, when you went to conferences, a VC would walk in the room and everyone would bow down. VCs were kings. Now you go to conferences, the VC walks in the thing and no one even uh, talks to the VC anymore. That's how much they care about VCs. Now the VCs go and they, have, they hire young people so that they can go and network with people like this so that, they can, so that they don't miss out on opportunities. Because the cost of starting a company has dropped exponentially. I founded two companies. The first one was in 1990. For that comp software companies. I raised 20, you know, not I, we, my, t you know, um, my boss was the CEO, I was the chief technology officer. We raised $20 million to start a software company. That's what we needed. Second company, 1997, we raised $3 million. If I was starting a start software company today, it would probably raise $50,000. I'd probably get it from my parents and my friends, and that's how I would start my company. And this is how things have changed. You can start a company with almost nothing and get it to critical mass. You start gaining momentum, and when, you need the, when, when you're ready for the exponential growth, that's when the VCs flock to you. They come begging on your doorstep, wanting to be part of it because they feel they'll be left out. That's how much things have changed. So you don't need venture capital anymore and, to start your company. And by the way, that's a moment for global capital too. Because maybe that's one of the biggest problems of trends is that most of the entrepreneurs focus and are obsessed about getting finance locally in a world where capital is global. So if, if you reach a momentum and if you reach a real traction with a clear business model right now, money can come from anywhere, basically. Even your seed capital, you can use Indiegogo or Kickstarter. I don't know if they're equivalent um, uh, crowdfunding tools in, in France or not. If not, there's an opportunity for you to create one. Create the French equivalent of, of the uh, you know, Indiegogo. You don't need to depend on American sites to do that. There's an opportunity here for you. And by the way, Copying is good. Even though I was negative about China, there's no reason why you can't see the next hot startup in Silicon Valley and do a French version of it, and then do a Spanish version of it. And because Silicon Valley doesn't even know that France exists. If you ask people in America where France is, I mean, as they did with uh, you know, uh, some school students, they can't even tell you where it is on the map. So this, and Silicon Valley entrepreneurs drop, uh, you know, the most famous ones drop out of college, so they never even learn the basics of it. <laughs> so you have an opportunity right now to uh, take the cool ideas, bring them here, and to build real world-changing businesses here. <laughs> uh, Without sorry, venture capital. So, sorry, that's too big for me. Can we talk about this dropout thing? Because, yeah, I... Uh, There's another thing which makes my blood boil. Yeah, I know, I know. Can we talk about future TL 20 under 20? Yeah. 
Well, uh, well j just to give a little perspective to the room, uh, Peter Thiel is a very famous engineer, and he offered to 20 under 20 years old students every year $100,000 at the condition that they don't go to the college. So maybe we, I, I know you have a very oh, yeah, yeah. point on that. When I first heard about it, uh, what, two and a half, three years ago, I wrote an article for TechCrunch titled, Friends Don't Let Friends Take Education Advice from Peter Thiel. That was an American joke uh, about friends don't let friends don't drink when they drive. I said, uh, because, and I, I basically ripped into Peter Thiel saying that this is a disaster, that he's asking kids to drop out of college. You need education before you, you know how to build a company. You need to know management. You need to know finance. You need to know what you don't know. You need to learn the basics. Uh, 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 before you can build a company. We cannot learn that online now. Uh, you still need to know the basics of it. Basic education is, is mandatory. And I, what I predicted was that the Peter Thiel program would fail. All right? This was three years ago and created an uproar in Silicon Valley. I had other people attacking me. Then I had a debate with Peter Thiel. It, yeah, I squared. It was broadcast nationally <laughs> in which I lost the debate. I mean, this is one thing which pisses me off that Americans are so anti-education right now that despite the fact I was very persuasive, I lost the debate to Peter Thiel. <laughs> yeah. It really made me angry. And guess what? I wrote an article for Forbes a few weeks ago. The title of it was, Billionaire's Failed Education Experiment Shows There's No Path to Success. So far, there have been, what, 60 companies, 60 you know, promising children have gone through Peter Thiel's program. And guess what the most hyped success is? A company that did caffeine spray. Instead of drinking caffeine, you spray it onto your body, and it gives you energy. That's the best thing that came out of Peter Thiel's program. Complete disaster. Almost every single company that came out of it was a disaster. He promised that they would be, you know, Peter Thiel's logo uh, is that um, they promised us flying cars, instead we got 140 characters. In other words, we were promised all these major innovations and all we got was stupid Twitter. And his thing three years ago was that I'm gonna take these kids who have some, all this promise and turn them into Mark Zuckerbergs who are going to do world-changing companies. The best world-changing company they can do is brain dead caffeine spray. Complete disaster. So, in fact, Peter Thiel's program has now turned into an education program. Instead of providing education in school, now you go and learn, you get education in their, in their uh, foundation because they're so embarrassed about the fact it's been a complete utter disaster that um, they're, they're still spending money on it because money is no object for Peter Thiel. But, but his reputation is, so therefore they're, they're now turning it into an education program. But what it proved is that education is a must, that it's not good enough just to be smart, you need to have a basic platform from which to build success. Why not complete your education? Why not spend another two years finishing your degree, then you have start a, a company? What's the hurry? Knowledge is important, but the, what you build in college is the, are the social skills. You learn how to do teamwork. You learn how to interact with other people. You learn how to deal with failure. You, deal, you know, the, the guys, for example, uh, most of the guys I know go around hitting on every girl they can, right? And they get, they fail nine out of 10 times. Well, that's how it is in entrepreneurship. You fail nine out of 10 times, right? 10 times you get lucky, <laughs> but uh, you learn how to deal with rejection. If you haven't been through that process, if you haven't built those social skills, you never deal, you learn how to deal with the, the social stigma that comes with failure or or how to be persistent. So there's an element that comes from going to college. There's an element that you get from, from online learning. So my view is in the future, we will do a lot of the knowledge transfer using online education, using, uh, in fact, current online education is brain dead to me. It's like when you first had uh, TV, they put radio broadcasters with microphones in front of a TV because they had no idea what a TV could do. Now we have an interactive medium, but that's how the MOOCs are right now. It's simply putting people, you know, Salman Khan, you, instead of, um, um, uh, you know, having a lecture, you just videotape Salman Khan giving a, 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 a lecture and, and put it online. That's version 1.0 of online education. Next five years, we will get to an environment where most of the learning happens using interactive, uh, learn, new, new methods of interactive learning, but you still need the social development, and that's what the university is about. The role of universities will change into collaborative learning and thinking and, and team building. Three and a half years ago, uh, my wife and I uh, moved to Silicon Valley. TechCrunch invited me to write for them, so I started writing for TechCrunch. 
And then um, the big TechCrunch event is, was the Crunchies, is what the big TechCrunch, it's like the Academy Awards of Silicon Valley for the tech industry. So we go there, my wife and I are sitting in the VIP section next to Mark Zuckerberg. And my wife says, Vivek, do you notice something strange over here? This is halfway into the conference. I said, yeah, we're sitting next to Mark Zuckerberg. <laughs> she says, no, 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 look around. Uh, what, uh, what do you see? I said, we see a lot of you know, really interesting people. She says, no, Vivek, what, do you, what don't you see? She was getting angry at me. So I, I said, she said, where are the women? And you know, in this room, we have a lot of women. I think maybe because uh, our friend offered a discount, better discount to the women. <laughs> but, uh, but regardless, this is a pretty balanced audience. We went, when we went to TechCrunch event, I realized that the whole evening we'd been sitting there, there were only two women on stage. You had staff from TechCrunch, and then you had a circus uh, uh, performer, a clown, uh, uh, with, a, with a clown. They were the only two people on stage the whole evening. And when you looked in the audience, they were all male. And that was a shock to me. I didn't even notice that there was something wrong over there. So I went back, I had been researching entrepreneurship. I went back and looked at all my research and I realized that I had uh, surveyed and interviewed thousands of entrepreneurs. I had not even recorded the gender of the uh, entrepreneurs. They were so, I was so ignorant about the issue of gender. So I went back and started reverse engineering my own, my own research. My last study, I went and made hundreds of phone calls, web queries, to look at the difference between men and women. And I crunched the data, there was no difference between men and women. And, and then I also wrote about it, I wrote a piece for, uh, for TechCrunch, titled Silicon Valley, you and your venture capitalists, your VCs have a gender problem. I was stunned at the negative comments I started getting, I mean, hatred, I mean. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, yeah, I yeah, remember I mean, commenting of the article and receiving something like 100 messages in my inbox because I, uh, I just replied to a guy. So yeah. it, it was a nightmare. It was this disgusting. I mean, this male sexist culture. I'm sure you have a male sexist culture in France also, but it can't be anything as perverted as Silicon Valley is. I mean, um, all sorts of personal attacks. I mean, um, uh, you know, I mean, sexual comments, innuendo. I mean, and I began to realize something is seriously wrong over here. This is a a disgusting uh, community that I'm in the middle of. I used to rave about, you know, just like I was raving about Silicon Valley and, and immigrants and how it's a, it's a meritocracy. I used to be Silicon Valley's biggest proponent. And then I saw this ugly side of Silicon Valley in which the men were bashing women. And I said, what is wrong over here? And then I started write, researching it more, writing more about it. And most recently I did a research project at Stanford in which we interviewed, surveyed 500 and something women. Then, but when you write, when I have my academic, right now I'm being an entrepreneur over here, I'm talking openly. When I'm in university, and this, despite the fact that it's university, when I'm in universities, when I give university lectures, when I'm with my academic friends, I have to be very formal, I have to be proper. I sometimes even wear a tie <laughs> for those events. In academic papers, you can't express opinion. If you do, uh, you never, you know, they don't get published. I want to express opinion. So I decided to write a book about uh, the challenge women face. And it occurred to me that who am I, a guy, to tell women what their problems are? I don't experience that. So I decided to crowdsource the book. I tried to crowdfund it. I needed $30,000, $40,000. I ended up getting $96,000 on Indiegogo and uh, sponsorships. I wanted 30 or 40 women to help me write the book. We ended up having more than 500 women. I wanted 10 ambassadors you know, to help me promote the word on social media, 300 ambassadors. That was the type of strong support I got from women. And um, within six weeks, we had thousands of pages of information. I did five years of research within six weeks by crowd creating the book. So right now, we finished the book, we're gonna publish it. My book is gonna be called Innovating Women. All of you should read it, especially the guys, because it's the stories of women who have gone and had problems. I mean, Women who went in front of venture capitalists, the, uh, the, the venture capitalists start looking at their, at their breasts. The venture capitalists start asking them uh, questions about what does your husband think about it. You know, I mean, just disgusting, uh, perverted uh, uh, behavior from venture capitalists. Don't go to the venture capitalists is what I'm telling women. Build your own companies. Go to Indiegogo and raise money um, and bootstrap it. Go to uh, you know, organizations that support women. There, there are some, some great... You know, like Astia is, uh, uh, is a great organization. And see, there are a bunch of, of great organizations that help women. Be successful 
and, and work with these organizations and then add women to your board. You be the next Facebook, you be the next Twitter, and put these existing companies out of business. That's the way you should um, deal with the problem. It won't take long. Within three years, we could have dozens of uh, multi-billion dollar women-oriented, com women-led companies which have women boards. <laughs> All right, well, let's talk about the future. I mean, uh, this is another thing which I, um, I, I lecture about, is that three or four years ago, if you had talked to me, I was pessimistic. I was worried that, uh, that the world was getting overpopulated, that we would run out of energy. I mean, we used to fear that we would run out of, out of natural resources, that we would run out of energy that uh, World War III would break out over, over water, that disease would, would wipe out humanity. And, and, and you know, in, in America, the government was shut down because you have this extreme wing of the Republican Party arguing that we should not be insuring the public. Let these millions of people die and suffer just so that our taxes don't go too high because the healthcare system, if we have to insure everyone and have everyone being healthy, we will become bankrupt because medical costs are going, uh, increasing. A lot of this comes from the fear of scarcity. If you read my articles right now, for example, I wrote a piece for Forbes and also LinkedIn, and I've written several articles on the same theme. I talk about the fact that I believe this is the most innovative period in human history, when we will solve the grand challenges of, of humanity, when we will now go from an era of scarcity to an era of abundance. You know, look at the, how things have progressed. We all know about computing, okay? We have an abundance of computing uh, energy. When I was young, when I was going to college, we used to have these PDP-11 machines. Computing was very scarce. We would have to have computer time. We would have to ration the time you had in front of computers. Today, computing has become free, okay? So is knowledge. When I was young, the Encyclopedia Britannica was the ultimate luxury symbol, that the rich had encyclopedias. And the encyclopedias gave you unlimited knowledge. Today, the Encyclopedia, uh, 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 Encyclopedia Britannica app is nothing. It's, we don't even download it because it's so out of date. We have unlimited knowledge. It's become abundant and free. Right? If you move forward, the same will happen with energy. Um, in, in America, you have fracking, which is demolishing the environment, but which is now making oil abundant. But that's nothing. There are hundreds of new applications of, of uh, new um, methods of generating energy which are likely to succeed over the next few years. But if you look at solar, which is now, a f in the USA, solar is a four-letter word. Just like uh, Obamacare has become uh, a bad thing, insuring, um, uh, insuring people is a bad thing, so is solar and energy. For the same reason that you have the wackos and, you know, in the Republican Party attacking um, uh, the government for subsidizing uh, solar energy which, uh, for a project that failed. This is stupid. The cost of solar has dropped 97.1% over 35 years. At the rate at which it's going, within five years, Europe will become, um, uh, um, sorry, we will achieve grid parity in solar, which means that it's cheaper to generate solar than to buy from the grid. Within seven to 10 years, the USA will, become, will achieve grid parity. Already you're seeing that the, the, um, the, the uh, utility companies in America are beginning to panic. They're now lobbying against the government for subsidies. They're demanding that, uh, that uh, people who are connected to the grid, who have solar panels, start paying extra money because they know that they're going to be out of business soon. That soon, solar panels, uh, it'll be cheaper to get energy from solar panels than to buy it from the utility. Move forward another five years. The cost of solar panel will be a fraction of what it is from grid. The entire electric industry, you know, the fossil fuel industry, will be out of business within 15 to 20 years at the way things are going, just in solar. I drive a Tesla electric vehicle. Okay, I have a, a passive home. I have a, a solar passive home. My energy bill for electricity, for gas, and for electric, including all my driving, is $4 a month, because that's what I have to pay for the utility. In other words, I'm living energy free. Zero is my cost for doing all these things. Five to 10 years from now, that'll be all of your stories, that your cost of energy will be zero. So you have unlimited energy, and um, guess what happens? You can have unlimited food, because you can start 3D printing meat, which is uh, under development. You can start having vertical farms and start growing meat, and uh, sorry, start growing unlimited vegetables. We have unlimited food. Water, um, I'm involved with two projects. Um, I've, you know, I've seen two projects which could solve the world's water problem. One is Dean Kamen's slingshot, 
You can Google that, an amazing device. Another one is out of Chile, Santiago, Chile, a company that I'm mentoring, AIC Chile, where Alfredo Zalezi has developed this ability to take water into plasma, back into water. This device, which will cost less than $500 for a village, consumes about 100 watts of energy, can kill all the bacteria and viruses, 100% of the bacteria and viruses within water. The National Sanitation Foundation tested it 22 times because they couldn't believe the results. This happened three or four months ago. So Leslie's device could solve a big chunk of the infectious disease problem in the world because most of the infectious disease is caused by waterborne viruses. Imagine now if you can uh, sanitize water, have home units, which right now, even in France, we you know, have these expensive water bottles because we don't trust the tap water. Let alone that you're having pollutants coming in from the plastic you have over here, the water sits idle and bacteria multiply. This is really sick, unhealthy water that you're drinking. Imagine now if you could have small units which sanitize the water, so 100% pure, clean, uh, uh, bacteria-free water. I'm not, you can, I'm not talking about removing the, the, you know, the minerals from it, but I'm talking about just killing the bacteria. But this technology is already perfected in Chile. So I'm working right now with, uh, uh, with Alfredo's company. Avena Foundation of, of Switzerland has bankrolled it. They're talking about launching the largest humanitarian effort in world history in South America over the next two or three years. Bolivia is investing in it. Most likely, Europe will also start bringing this technology in. We can solve the world's water problem within the next three to five years. So all these amazing advances are happening. So we're moving into an era of unlimited food, water, energy, in which the debates, we, we're going to, I mean, all of these things are happening in the labs. We're going to have ugly debates over the next few years about how do we distribute this prosperity. That fine, you'll have the rich that have it, you'll have the elite that have it. How do you get it to the poor? How do you distribute it? And then there'll be an, another uglier battle. Where are the jobs? That um, manufacturing, right now, as of this year, it's cheaper to manufacture in the USA and Europe than it is in China because of robotics. You can buy a $22,000 robot that does everything that a human being does with their hands. The robot doesn't drink, it doesn't complain, it doesn't commit suicide, it doesn't have labor unions, it'll work 24 hours a day. So this is possible already. Where are the jobs going to be? I think we'll become like the French. They will be, will be arguing about um, shorter work weeks. You know, uh, if the French had their way, we would have 30-hour work week. Well, why not have 10-hour work weeks? Why, why not outdo the French? Who says we have to work 50 hours a week, 60 hours a week? Our parents, our grandparents used to work 100 hours a week. They would be in, in you know, manufacturing or be in the farms all the time. We, they, they didn't, you know, we used to work extremely hard. The French work 32 hours a week, 35 hours a week, and they, they go on strike to complain about it. They have to work too hard. Right? Which is a good thing. So, which means that the French will be more ready than other countries will for the era of abundance because they'll just work less. <laughs> they'll be drinking more. <laughs> you, you know, what I'm seeing is the fact that you people are getting together here. Okay, this, is, this is something which would not have happened, would not have happened five years ago. That you had, um, because I've, I've spent, I mean, I've been to France many times, especially during my days as a technology CEO. It used to be the big companies that dominated the landscape. The big companies, the big powerhouses, big government. You didn't have this entrepreneurial system where young kids, I mean, look at, look at the back of this room. You have young kids in a, in, in a, in a stodgy old management school learning entrepreneurship. This is, this is new. The fact is that their parents probably still feel uncomfortable with them becoming entrepreneurs, but the fact is they accepted the fact that they'll become entrepreneurs. This is, this is what's going to change France that you have an entire generation right now that's accepting risk, that's accepting failure, that's expecting experimentation, and that isn't expecting government subsidies for everything because these people are not part of the safety net. When you become an entrepreneur, you're on your own. If you fail, you're screwed, right? So this, this is what you're seeing happening over here. The fact that you've got 200 people show up for a talk like this, the fact that you now have Osama coming back to France to start up an incubator here, and doing this thing, and he's one of many. I mean, uh, there were you know, several dozen uh, organizations that are now mentoring entrepreneurs. This will grow. What needs to happen, my, you know, my, my uh, lesson, I mean, if I had to give you advice, what I would tell you is that you need to now start helping each other. You need to start mentoring each other. You need to start sharing information. Get out of your, your cubby holes. The perspective in many countries is that if you share information, someone will steal your idea. The perspective in Silicon Valley is that if you share your idea, 
the, the idea doubles, it triples. That you have an idea, another person has an idea, both of you get one more idea each, and then because you have those ideas, it triples. You now have a third idea that comes along. That's the perspective in Silicon Valley. So when you go to Silicon Valley and you go to the cafes over there, you know, if you ever visit there, just try that. Go to Starbucks, go to Pete's Cafe, go to any, any cafe over there, the Copa Cafe in, in Palo Alto, and, and go walk up to anyone who's sitting there on their computer and start talking to them. They'll stop what they're doing, they'll start talking to you. What do you do? They'll start telling you all, about all the things that they do. They'll, tell, they'll open up and tell you about the company they're building, they'll tell you about their failures, their successes, you share your idea with them and they'll start giving you critical feedback on it. That's the magic of Silicon Valley. That's what you need to start doing over here, start helping each other. Because you'll realize that by sharing ideas, you enrich the ecosystem. You start now getting smarter. Now, now you make friends, you can go to them. Because the lessons of entrepreneurship are the same. That um, it's, all, it, you know, building a company is always the same experience. That, that you have some success factors, you have failure factors, you have management issues, you have to deal with, with investors who are ruthless, you know, um, uh, merciless, and, and then you have to deal with employees who are difficult to deal with. It's always the same lessons. The differences are in the ideas you're implementing. To the extent that you can now start sharing ideas and sharing lessons on how to build a company, and then you can start improving your ideas with the experience other people have, you get better and the people you're talking to get better. So that's what, if you can now take what you have here, the fact that you're getting together, this is amazing, and now start sharing ideas, you will have your own Silicon Valley over here. You will now be able to uh, start building the next you know, major uh, uh, French companies because the old line companies are gonna be, with this exponential technologies, it's almost certain that within the next five to 10 years, almost all of the current existing you know, Fortune 500 type companies, the, the leaders will uh, be out of business or will be on their path to being out of business because of disruptive change. The disruption can come from you people. It can come from the students back there. They can now start building these world changing companies that puts the French leaders out of business if they start now. That's the opportunity, but it's all about networking, mentoring, giving back, sharing your lessons, and, and, and essentially working together. Do that and the magic will happen. Thank you.